for evaluation of SIFs. Then uh, digital image correlation used in fracture mechanics and uh, damage initiation and a uh, short presentation of our current research in additive manufacturing. So uh, going through the analytical solutions, uh, of course, we have to start with Williams solution, which is uh, well known. It's a general solution, uh, valid either in plain strain or uh, plain stress. Uh, well, it's valid regarding the shape, the size, and the loading applied on the boundaries. The solution has been established uh, by considering uh, an area function uh, working in uh, polar coordinates. The development in series gives you the sigma r, sigma theta, and tau r theta uh, stresses. And uh, later on, uh, the constants uh, into this uh, series of functions were notated uh, as uh, written here. Um, and then, of course, uh, if we transform these um, uh, stresses into a Cartesian system, uh, we have a first term, mode one, mode two, and for the sigma x only, a constant which uh, has been notated by A, which appears here in for the sigma x term. On the other hand, uh, it is again well known the Westergaard solution. Westergaard solution is valid only for uh, specific uh, loading. This means a biaxial uh, stress field. The complex uh, approach was chosen. This means a complex uh, function which has uh, this form. And of course, uh, stresses can be established out of this function. And of course, imposing the boundary conditions. So uh, this means that uh, you have uh, shearing stress uh, zero for uh, y equals zero and having also a change of coordinates to the tip of the crack. Initial system of coordinates was in the middle of the crack. Uh, so working now with a Z star coordinate, complex uh, coordinate. Uh, one can obtain uh, this new uh, function, which uh, shows, of course, the singularity of the stresses. Now, uh, I have to mention that uh, this uh, complex function Z of Z uh, has to be changed if you have some other geometry of some other loading. So this one noticed uh, in a paper, uh, this is, uh, was written in 58 by uh, Wilson Post. They were looking at uh, photoelastic fringes around the graph tip and they have noticed uh, something uh, which uh, surprised them at that moment. This means that uh, fringes leaning forward uh, meant that the crack was uh, stable and then of course they have noticed that uh, the fringes start to move uh, backwards when the uh, crack becomes unstable. This uh, observation was followed by a discussion done by Irwin uh, at the same conference and uh, he noted that it should be a term, a constant term which should be added here in uh, the calculation of uh, sigma x following this development of uh, uh, Irwin uh, of, uh, sorry, uh, Westergaard and of course uh, Irwin's observation uh, was this. In this way you could accommodate this uh, leaning of uh, fringes. Then followed the sixth solution. Sixth solution uh, underlined that um, uh, you could work with Westergaard's function. He followed this uh, gursat kolosov solution, developed the stress uh, the calculation of stresses, and finally, by choosing a uh, uh, complex function of this form, appeared indeed a term which became now 2a, only for the sigma x calculation. So in a way, he confirmed uh, the observations done by uh, Irwin some time uh, ago. Eftis and Leibovitz, uh, uh, in a way, generalized the Westergaard solution. So they said, okay, we have a biaxial uh, uh, stress field, but this time we are going to consider uh, 
an alpha sigma instead of sigma. So this makes possible the consideration of alpha as being zero or uh, minus one. So you can have traction compression. And again, working with complex functions of uh, this type of forms, uh, they uh, have uh, at the end imposed that the shearing stress should be zero again along the crack line. And this meant in fact that the imaginary part of uh, this uh, function here should be zero. So uh, uh, this part here in fact, and this means that uh, we can simply consider this uh, parenthesis as having an addition of, uh, they have notated this uh, real constant and this was notated by them by B. So essentially speaking, the new function they have uh, proposed uh, was the previous Westergaard function with B added here, which B was related to this uh, loading, essentially speaking, 2a from the previous uh, six solution became one minus alpha times sigma. So uh, again, with alpha being uh, one and then they, uh, the constant will disappear or uh, zero or minus one. So different uh, possibilities for the loading. Finally, Sanford solution. Sanford uh, had a more uh, drastic approach in the sense that he said, well, uh, and this was done in this paper in 79, he said, uh, uh, we can consider a complex function, essentially speaking. For this complex function, uh, we can impose the, that the imaginary part has to be zero. So this means shearing stress is zero. And this, uh, ended towards considering two complex functions of this form. So series expansion, uh, there his notation was from n equals zero to n. So here you can start with the first uh, uh, term n equals zero, this means singularity and so on with the other term. So uh, his idea, uh, he was afterwards employed at the University of Maryland and there it was, uh, there were many papers uh, published, uh, some of them with Dali and some others with many other PhD students, uh, which worked with uh, strain gauge measurements and photoelasticity, considering several terms into this development of series of functions. And uh, things went uh, over up to 12 terms uh, for, uh, for the elastic, uh, analysis, and this was done by Chona in his PhD. Um, so essentially getting uh, towards uh, this uh, non-singular terms further away from the crack. So what this meant? Well, this meant that uh, first of all, for strain gauge evaluation of stress intensity factors, we can use these two complex functions. We can calculate strains as epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon y and shearing uh, uh, strain with this form. And we can measure with a strain gauge, the strain on a direction inclined with an angle alpha. So this means direction x prime. Uh, of course, this position uh, being related to the angle theta and uh, radius r from the tip of the crack. Now, the story is the following. Where can you place the strain gauge to measure strain? Of course, you have to avoid the process zone, which is notated by three. This is around the crack tip, which is opening, and we're going to discuss more about this issue. Then you can get into uh, zone two, which is a so-called K-dominance region or you can go further away and measure in zone one where you need an expanded solution. This means series of function. And of course you can have here many measurements and you can have an uh, over deterministic uh, evaluation of uh, uh, strains and the stress intensity factors. And of course, choosing the appropriate uh, values uh, with some kind of algorithm, numerical algorithm uh, by uh, least square method. So 
The idea was this one. Well, it looks quite complicated because if you consider six terms, so this means three terms from one of the function, three terms from the other, and the coefficients are, of course, unknown. You get into this uh, development, which uh, looks quite complicated, but uh, if you resume your analysis, not to all the terms, but some of them, and you have a look here. First of all, you see that B0 vanishes if the angle alpha of inclination of the strain gauge is related to Poisson's ratio. So this means that if you take only three terms, and this means A0, A1, B0, you have B0 equals to zero if cosine of two alpha is given by this relation. And then for A1, this means this term, which is uh, this parenthesis, you are going to have a value that's being zero if you have a relation between the, let's say, polar angle theta and the angle alpha of inclination. So for three terms, you have at the end a very simple relation by which K1, modal stress intensity factor, is A0 square root of 2 pi with this whole uh, parenthesis, which should be calculated as a function of Poisson's ratio, angle theta and angle alpha. So in fact, it's uh, manageable. So this means that and it was also another type of solution considering four terms, at least for string gauge measurements. So uh, we wanted to double check this uh, uh, theoretical uh, solution and uh, we did some experimental uh, measurements considering this uh, plate. Central crack of length to A uh, with known established uh, models of elasticity and uh, Poisson's ratio. And we choose three different positions. So one position one was here somewhere uh, at five millimeters from the crack tip with angle alpha and theta established from the previous relation. Then we moved a little bit further away at 10 millimeters from the crack tip because we wanted to know how efficient is such a solution de well, depending on the distance from the crack tip. And then a third position, which was somehow uh, placed at an arbitrary angle, this means uh, alpha equals theta 45 degrees. So in order to obtain uh, the experimental value of the stress intensity factor, which would be given by this uh, particular relation, we, can we used uh, strain gauges uh, with a gauge length uh, um, smallest as possible, 0 0.6 millimeters. This was steel, so we have used uh, strain gauges with uh, compensation for steel. And uh, of course, knowing the constants and so on of this uh, strain gauge. So what we have obtained? Well, we have obtained, uh, of course, uh, in over three points of measurement uh, for different uh, loadings, uh, load levels, values of the stress and tense factor. And these were compared to the theoretical ones for this uh, simple case of middle crack. What we obtained, of course, was quite interesting. Um, position two was the one in which we got the best results. So this means position two further away from the crack tip. So in a way, we got to read this clear from the process zone and uh, we were able to obtain a proper result getting into this um, uh, multi-term uh, region, let's say. For uh, strain gauge free, results were quite poor. The poorest probably as being further away from uh, what theory would predict uh, in this point three. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> this was uh, quite uh, interesting and encouraging. And then of course we followed some other approach by using this time an aluminum plate with uh, dimensions uh, a, uh, given uh, uh, in millimeters here and using several strain gauges at zero degrees, 45, 90, 135, and uh, another strain gauge here on the back of the, uh, close to the flank of the crack uh, from the tip to see what happens. Of course, again, same uh, type of strain gauges uh, 
dimensions are given here. Uh, this is uh, how uh, this uh, experiment was prepared. And uh, we have uh, changed the width of this aluminum plate for which we knew we established E and mu as to have the different ratios, yes. And measuring, of course, again, with strain gauges of the same smallest strain gauge. Of course, here you can also use uh, chains of strain gauges, which are mainly used for fatigue problems, like uh, 10 in a row plus one for uh, comp temperature compensation. But at that moment, uh, we had only single strain gauges. So, um, just a, a small example of the results, uh, how the experimental uh, value compared to the analytical solution. Here, in fact, what you have as uh, analytical solutions, you have one, two, three, and four terms of, an, uh, of uh, uh, normalized, in fact, uh, strains, uh, as you see here, with respect to R over A. So you have non-dimensional coordinates here. And uh, what it is to be noticed is that for a theta equals zero, one term solution, this is some other analytical solution, not really this uh, one established by Sanford, but it's uh, the same. So for one term, you know, experimental measurements are far away. For uh, um, two, three terms uh, and uh, even four terms, we are somewhere close with the experimental results. If you go to 90 degrees, again, one term solution is further away from experimental results. And in fact, for 90 degrees, these two, three and four term solutions essentially overlap. Now, of course, uh, the problem here coming back with just one comment, I would like to make uh, a string gauge is uh, Strain gauge measurements can be used successfully. However, uh, you get the information only in one point. Of course, um, as we will discuss later, the use of digital image correlation, which is a full field method, is uh, more rewarding, let's say. And of course, that uh, nowadays, as you know, people are combining strain gauge measurements with digital image correlation as to get. Uh, some confirmation of uh, the experimental measurements in selected uh, points where you place the strain gauges. However, uh, one can establish quite precisely, I think, the stress intensity factor by this type of measurements uh, if it is needed. Yeah. Okay, now going to photoelastic evaluation of stress intensity factors here, we're going to have uh, a discussion First of all, on 2D photoelasticity and then on 3D photoelasticity. And there are several papers which I would like to uh, underline. Um, first of all, probably the first and photoelastic analysis was done by Professor Daniel Post in 54. Then the paper I mentioned, Wilson Post. Then some comments by Cottrell in uh, 65. He was talking about the influence of several terms and uh, brittle crack paths. Uh, then there were several algorithms which were used in uh, 2D photoelasticity. Um, on one hand, uh, Bradley and Kobayashi, Kalkaris and Tudos, uh, Sanford, as I mentioned, Smith, which uh, Professor uh, Bill Smith, which uh, First of all, had a chapter published in uh, the series of, uh, in the volume seven of this uh, uh, very well uh, known fracture mechanics textbook. So uh, the problem of uh, uh, propagating cracks and of stretch finch signatures has been a concern for uh, many years. And um, Following what was written in this uh, handbook on experimental mechanics chapter, and this was written by Smith and uh, Kobayashi. Uh, again, this would be the uh, series expansion, uh, which will have this form. This being the constant uh, stress uh, along the x-axis, so this became later after the 90s, the so-called T-stress. And of course, um, uh, this would be for mode one, uh, the first uh, singular term. Now I have to mm, maybe underline uh, that it is a different uh, 
type of approach. So Sanford said and his co-workers, well, uh, we can go further away from the crack tip and uh, we can um, establish uh, eventually the stress intensity factor using a multi-term solution and analyzing uh, the strains or stresses further away. Uh, these other types of approaches and uh, the one which is used in what I'm going to present further is uh, underlining that uh, in fact essentially you want to measure the stress intensity factor and this has to be established in the so-called k-dominance region. So this needs to be a measurement done quite close to the crack tip but further away from the process zone. I mean, you cannot measure anything in the process zone. So essentially you have uh, to be close enough and uh, this type of uh, algorithm will be followed uh, in uh, uh, the presentation. So now short, uh, shortly a few things for uh, those which may not be accustomed with elasticity. This is a whole field non-destructive technique. Uh, it's based on the, the so-called property of uh, birefringence of uh, transparent polymers. So essentially speaking, uh, this is uh, what's presented here is a circular polar, uh, polariscope. It has a polarizer, analyzer at the upper end, model in the middle, and the so-called quarter wave uh, plates, which uh, make the light to be circularly polarized. And the model, of course, in which due to this property of birefringence, you have the separation of uh, the stresses along the principal direction. So sigma one, the light will travel fast and along the direction of sigma two slow. Another help would be when establishing and using this method would be to use star decompensation. So this means that, uh, in fact, what you are doing, you are rotating the analyzer uh, with uh, some deep angle. And uh, of course, um, you will get some other fringe order. Uh, this relation which uh, gets the new fringe order is the previous value plus minus depends on the sense in which you are rotating the analyzer with an angle, uh, so if you divide it by pi, so if you choose this uh, angle as being, uh, let's say, 18 degrees, uh, divide it to 180, you have the previous n plus minus 0 0.1. So you get into fractional uh, order of uh, the fringe. Of course, um, well, uh, here you have to know if it's uh, plus or minus, but getting some experience, uh, you can uh, use successfully the study compensation, which is in fact extremely useful in such fracture mechanics, uh, let's say, measurements. On the other hand, uh, we have to talk a little bit about fringe order multiplication. Why? Because it is extremely important and extremely useful in many applications. What does this mean? Well, it means that uh, in some cases, instead of having one fringe, you can multiply, multiply these fringes. And uh, this is a picture is taken from a paper uh, written by uh, Professor Daniel Post. You can get nine fringes or even, let's say, more fringes, let's say 17. So it looks wonderful, yes? From one fringe, you are multiplying the order of the fringe and you can have a lot of data to measure what is going on, let's say, around the uh, stress rates. How this is done? Well, this is described by uh, Daniel Post in a paper written in 66 fringe multiplication in three-dimensional photoelasticity. And essentially speaking, uh, things are quite simple in the sense that uh, you are using, of course, uh, Polariscope with quarter wave length plates and so on. But you are taking a slice uh, which uh, is put in between two partial mirrors. So you have to have light going through these mirrors, but on the other hand, you need to have a good reflectiveness of these uh, partial mirrors. As you are going to have the 
uh, optimum the path of the light going uh, from one plate to the other. So specimen is in the middle. And of course, here you have some relations by which you can get uh, this multiplication. And of course, uh, obviously, you are going to have uh, the light uh, as a diminished contrast if you are looking for high order of multiplication, but uh, you are using also some uh, fluid to compensate. Uh, this is uh, in, in, uh, the mirrors are in, uh, immersed in a fluid here. I mean, the specimen is immersed in a fluid in between the two uh, mirrors. So uh, you are accommodating the refractive index. So things look quite simple, but uh, they are not really so simple because you need to obtain uh, a good uh, quality of uh, light uh, from optical point of view in order to be able to uh, measure something as fringes and uh, to see the good contrast of the fringes. So uh, this uh, method again can be used and then you can depict one of the multiplication orders further on and we are going to see this later. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, 2D photoelasticity. First of all, I'm showing you a picture with uh, a good picture with a crack and fringes around the crack tip. So crack tip, of course, is a little uh, about here. You have some blunting of the crack. This is a, a transparent photoelastic uh, material and you have these fringes the order of the fringe uh, can be counted. Uh, this is the uh, locus of the uh, um, difference of the principal stresses uh, as being a constant. We are going to talk about this a little bit later. So essentially what this suggests, well, it suggests that it is appropriate to look uh, for more fringes at 90 degrees and to establish in different points the order of the fringe of course, using tardy compensation, this will give you more data. And of course, later on going to 3D photoelasticity, also fringe multiplication. Fringe multiplication usually in 2D measurements uh, are not really needed. So uh, in some cases, of course, you may not be so successful in uh, obtaining so many fringes. Fringes, one more observation, they lean forward, so crack is stable in this moment. When uh, it becomes unstable, they go backwards at 90 degrees, so, and then when it's really unstable, they turn uh, towards the back of the crack, towards the crack flanks, and then the crack will propagate. And this was noticed by Wells and Post for the first time, and uh, as I have mentioned. So what means this uh, first mode one algorithm? Of course, considering uh, the dominant term and the upper term, uh, which, which this would be the second, uh, which may be constant. So in fact, it doesn't matter to match into this algorithm. Uh, you have to relate uh, laws of photoelasticity. So at 90 degrees measure the maximum shearing stress, uh, and this is related to the fringe order, to the thickness of the slice, and to the photoelastic constant of the material. And essentially speaking, uh, in this uh, algorithm, uh, you are measuring a normalized apparent stress intensity factor uh, as a function of the radio uh, of a square of R over A. And of course, you have to choose the zone which is appropriate as we're going to see in order to make some kind of extrapolation and to establish the normalized stress intensity factor at the tip of the crack. So we did some first uh, test uh, using uh, this single edge notch plate uh, with dimensions given here. And uh, we used also the tardy compensation uh, Generally speaking, uh, we had uh, good results or we could rely on some results in between our R over A, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. So generally speaking, this is a uh, zone where uh, you could use data. 
to extrapolate them to the crack tip and establish the normalized stress intensity factor at the crack tip and measure when establish it there. So here we use TARTI compensation um, using fractional fringe orders uh, in fixed position from the crack tip. At that moment it was easier like this. I'm going to explain you later why. So the results why were, essentially, were essentially speaking quite successful comparing experimental to theoretical values. We get only for one stress level quite a significant important difference. Otherwise, uh, we were quite close. Now, of course, if you have a homogeneous material, things are quite uh, simple. If you have a mixed mode algorithm, well, things are becoming uh, more complicated. So let's say we're talking about a bimaterial case when you want to make photoelastic measurements. Uh, what will happen as a fringe pattern is something like this. So you have <coughs> fringes of different size. You have fringes of different inclination. So going towards the crack tip, uh, you have to take care about this angle of inclination and uh, go towards the crack tip as establishing, uh, let's say, the value of in inclination, presumably at the crack tip on one hand, and on the other hand, taking into account that you have a mixed mode, you should correlate the stress, uh, the fringes with uh, normalized apparent stress intensity factor, which at its turn is a function of K1 and K2. So um, in this uh, textbook, on, uh, handbook on experimental mechanics, uh, I mentioned there are uh, all details uh, given in the, the chapter written by Smith and Kobiash. So essentially, of course, things are becoming more complicated. And uh, as a first example, uh, we have a steel plate, a crack at the interface. And here, uh, polyurethane uh, photoelastic PSM4 material. You see the difference in between uh, model elasticity is quite important. Uh, the value of uh, new is practically 0 0.5 for such a photoelastic material still consider 0.3. So here we are looking first of all at uh, two different uh, pictures. One is the dark field. Dark field means uh, when you have uh, the plane of polarization of the polarizer and analyzer crossed at 90 degrees. Bright field means when the two planes are parallel. So in dark field integral fringes are dark, in bright field, integral fringes are bright. Of course, you can imagine that, uh, as you can see here, uh, the problem uh, is uh, where is the middle of a fringe, from where you should measure the distance towards the crack tip, crack is on the right. Here are the fringes in uh, this uh, uh, PSM4, and uh, this would be the angle of inclination of these uh, fringes. Of course, in this case, we are talking about a mixed mode. And uh, as you know, theoretically speaking, things are quite complicated in such a situation. Uh, we have established the normalized apparent stress intensity factor uh, using tardy compensation. However, uh, even if the values look quite well from the point of view of extrapolation, uh, we uh, got values uh, greater than the theoretical ones, which will come out from uh, using the proper analytical solution. Um, uh, here, of course, I have to mention that probably uh, the angle uh, of inclination at the closer to the crack tip uh, was uh, probably not correctly established. And this makes a difference here in this calculation of uh, apparent stress intensity factor as uh, measuring the distances from the crack tip uh, was quite uh, a burden uh, in the sense that we didn't have a proper uh, micrometric system of measurements. Um, now, uh, if 
you have uh, cracks which are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in uh, such, uh, uh, let's say, uh, loading uh, situation uh, when you have uh, many of them, you may have also another problem. And this problem is that, as you can see, around the tip of the crack, the region is quite blurred. So this is the process zone. You cannot see too many of these cracks. This is uh, an issue which, uh, of these fringes, sorry, this is an issue which will uh, uh, complicate in some situation measurements. And if you even have a higher loading, a blunted crack, as you can see, practically speaking, whatever is in this area, zone free process zone, has to be taken out. So, in fact, we did some measurements uh, for. Uh, such cracks would be along a bond line between two different materials and uh, parallel to bond lines. Just I'm going to show you some of these uh, patterns of the fringes. And uh, the data zone, which is in fact available, uh, would be quite uh, further away from the crack tip. So the disturbance given by the bond line is even more significant. Here you have a white field. so. Uh, uh, Essentially speaking, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's a white field or a dark field, you should just know this, but the important thing is that you have to go further away. If you have uh, cracks which are parallel to bond lines, of course, as you can see here, the fringe pattern is uh, quite, uh, say, disturbed by the bond line. And if, uh, of course, it depends very much what is the distance from the crack tip towards the bond line, so uh, uh, this type of measurements uh, are not uh, very simple to be done and you need to have uh, accurate uh, possibility of measurement of the distance from the center of the fringe towards the tip of the crack. Another example here, which, in which you can see that uh, the interaction between the bone line and the crack tip, which in fact has propagated a little bit already here, uh, is uh, very complicated and uh, you may have uh, different types of, uh, let's say, extrapolation of the stress intensity factor towards the crack tip as to be able to measure correctly the stress intensity factor of the crack. Okay, now we'll go to 3D photoelasticity. 3D photoelasticity is well known for uh, many years, introduced in uh, 1936. Um, essentially speaking, you are doing the so-called stress freezing. This means that uh, you have to reach a temperature, uh, which we'll call it uh, critical temperature. This critical temperature is uh, close to the glass transition temperature of uh, the photoelastic material. What is the important issue is that uh, when you go through this temperature, the material becomes linear elastic, so you get rid of the viscoelastic coefficient. The modulus of elasticity becomes uh, about 1 600th of uh, its value at room temperature, so 1 over 600. Material becomes incompressible, and you have the stress fringe sensitivity of the material uh, above Tc, uh, about 20 times value at uh, its value at the room temperature. So this makes a difference. So essentially what you have to do, you have to go through, uh, slowly through this critical temperature, uh, load of course the material, the specimen, whatever you have, and then go back and freeze uh, the deformations, in fact, although it's called frozen stress method, you are freezing the deformations and you can analyze thin slices uh, as uh, in two-dimensional elasticity, but you have a three-dimensional effect embedded in these fringes. So essentially speaking, you can cut thin slices, let's say around the crack front, and um, you can use uh, such a device. Uh, this uh, was available at uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, 
uh, in the, the laboratory were uh, were uh, co-shared by let's say by Professor Daniel Post and Bill Smith, and uh, it shows in principle the scheme of the polariscope, which is this part. Uh, this is a very simple polariscope of uh, let's say didactic use and you have here and this is the main part of this thing uh, the uh, uh, specimen the thin slice which is put here in between the two partial mirrors so you have the fringe multiplication unit here and of course you have this uh, micrometer uh, system of measurement of displacement and this is extremely useful to make uh, your position of the fringe correctly established with respect to the crack tip. So uh, you are focusing with this lens, you can choose with uh, from the diffraction orders the one uh, which you think is appropriate and then you have some reflection here and you see the fringes on this uh, glass. So essentially your measurements are done here by once again choosing a certain order of multiplication and of course uh, using also tardy compensation because it helps a lot. Why is this useful? Well, it's useful and this was applied uh, for a particular pore problem and this particular problem was uh, solid propellant. Solid propellant which is a composite material and uh, which is a mixture of the soft rubber matrix with uh, embedded uh, particles. The recipe for this solid propellant is available on the internet. But the important thing is that solid propellant is uh, used for uh, different rockets and it sits at minus 40 degrees. And at minus 40 degrees the material becomes essentially brittle. So then an analogy can be done between uh, the behavior of this type of uh, uh, material and uh, measurements done with this uh, 3D frozen stress for instance. So uh, this is a model of such a uh, solid propellant. Well the inner shape is given uh, from uh, specific conditions of uh, thermodynamics of burning because the burning of a solid propellant is done from inside towards outside. And they have noticed uh, this is a 1 to 10 uh, scale uh, geometry. Um, they have noticed cracks which were appearing off axis and uh, symmetric. So this means in the middle and here in the off axis position would be somewhere in between the radius. Uh, there are two radii here, one very small 1.3 at this scale and the other one at the tip of the thin, how it is called, which is 11 millimeters. So essentially what you can do, well, you can uh, dr dr uh, drill a hole, you can use such a device, which is ki kind of a sharpie blade. Uh, you can initiate by hitting with a hammer, the crack going on axis and off axis. And of course, then you have to grow this crack naturally by inputting internal pressure, we're going to see this. So, um, well, these models were casted uh, at uh, measurements group, uh, at Bichet, how it is called, and uh, the stress uh, freezing material was, of course, also from uh, this company. Now, what is the scheme of uh, stress freezing, the procedure by itself? So, the photoelastic model sits here, you have a pipe with uh, pressure, uh, air pressure into it. You, uh, of course, make the hole, uh, initiate an uh, artificial crack. Uh, then you glue some uh, rubber caps, uh, top and bottom, uh, and uh, you start to uh, increase the temperature inside the oven. And this has to be done very slowly. So the heating of the oven was done with this rate uh, a little bit above the so-called critical temperature. So we went up to 110 Celsius. And then you keep the model for uh, some hours. Of course, you have to look carefully 
what is going on with the crack, how it grows due to the internal pressure. So essentially speaking, the crack is naturally grown in this model and then cool back going with a very, very small uh, gradient of temperature, so 0 0.45 degrees per hour where we essentially used to drop the temperature, to go through the so-called critical temperature and to freeze the stresses. So one of these thermal cycles was taking uh, about one week. And here you have uh, some uh, fringes uh, in a, one of the models. Uh, on the right side here was the crack. This part was taken out. This is a slice cut from the model just for, uh, let's say, demonstration purposes. Uh, to see essentially what happens at the tip of uh, the, well, around the, let's say, surface of the fin uh, in dark field and in white field. And of course, uh, the problem is uh, uh, that you have many fringes. And these many fringes, you can see them here. So, uh, why this is important? Well, this is important because we needed to have a decision uh, where uh, it is worse to have the initial crack in the middle or in between this radius and the other one. So in this off axis position, because you see here the fringes are going towards this stress razor, which however appears here. We did some evaluation. So uh, after this evaluation, of course, you cannot go exactly at the surface. Uh, it looked like, in fact, uh, it was about the same. So around 20 uh, was the fringe order. So essentially what was noticed in reality, crack emanating from both location uh, is uh, um, correct, let's say. And on the other hand, of course, for each test, I wanted to also to mention, we did uh, calibration. So we established the fringe order by uh, having pure bending as uh, you know, and measuring the foot elastic constant. Now, of course, uh, depending on the crack uh, growth, you can have uh, uh, mixed mode, especially if it is uh, off axis. You cut thin slices about one millimeter thickness around the crack front, normal to the crack front, and then you use the algorithm of this type if it is mixed mode. As I already mentioned, essentially, you are looking for this normalized apparent stress intensity factor. Here you have the internal pressure, here you have the crack length, and here you have some correction. This is the square root of the elliptic integral because well, assumably you had the initial cracks as being uh, uh, an ellipse. And uh, then this parameter can be used if you have the mixed bulk. Now, what was noticed? Well, we had essentially two types of cracks as Cottrell named it. Class one means essentially mode one. So this can be a symmetric crack or this can be uh, off axis crack, which grew by eliminating mode, uh, sharing modes, we're going to see this further. And on the other hand, we may have class two cracks, which are cracks which uh, uh, grow, uh, eliminating shear modes, they move towards class one, but it depends on the moment in which you are stopping the test, you can still have mode two, situations. Yeah? So shortly speaking, uh, as we are going to see, we are going to have all kinds of crack surfaces, but mainly uh, all cracks will get towards uh, symmetric cracks. Here you have two of these cracks just to see a little bit uh, how uh, uh, these uh, are photos taken uh, before slicing uh, the crack. You have some initial crack here and then this is naturally grown. These are only two examples. Uh, mostly I wanted to show you that uh, the surface of the crack doesn't remain planar uh, during uh, growing. So you can have all kinds of uh, issues. As two examples, well, this is the, let's say, uh, initial crack. 
the initial crack is this one, the starter crack. Uh, here you have some damage due to the blade, but in some cases you may need to strike uh, with a hammer twice to grow a little bit more the crack. And then the crack will start to propagate from the initial position, and this was the off-axis initial position. And then it will uh, lean like this, and this is for the moment a mixed mode. And then it will uh, turn towards mode one as it is more or less here. Of course, uh, from the point of view of the um, crack surface, uh, uh, this is uh, again an initial crack. What you can see is that after from the initial position, the crack grows uh, quite interestingly. So there are some, uh, let's say, river marks here. And this is, in fact, the elimination of uh, mode three, essentially, uh, as it is uh, written here. On this side, there are even more uh, such uh, striations, let's say. You have uh, the crack will accommodate, uh, not uh, growing really by being keeping its uh, semi-elliptical shape, but you can see that there are some wings here at the surface, which may be more extended. And uh, uh, I'm going to show you several of these grown cracks. Uh, this is uh, in the initial position, and these are different stages uh, turning. This is a kind of a lateral view of this uh, grown crack. Uh, but what is to be mentioned here is that it is almost a semi elliptical uh, shape after growing. Here you have uh, uh, different stages from the initial crack of growing, so changing of turning little by little, or again, as it is in this case, and uh, here you can see, uh, slightly see that this is this kind of higher wing, crack grew in the middle, not so much, but at the end of these triations, getting rid of mode three, already crack grows more on the surface. So, what uh, this tells you, this tells you that the crack growing naturally will accommodate its shape as trying to get uniform distribution of the stress intensity factor around the crack front. And uh, in some cases, uh, as you can he see here, you had this point of kind of angular point in which uh, this uh, growth towards the surface was evidently done uh, at a certain moment uh, after, once again, eliminating mode three. Again, two different positions, uh, two different, let's say, uh, light adjustments for the same crack. Why? Because in some cases you had some uh, non-regular uh, crack front, so this means that you had this kind of irregularities, again, coming into one of these triations, as you can see here, so uh, what I'm trying to say that is uh, three-dimensional growing crack uh, will not be planar, uh, especially if it is in uh, off-axis position, non-symmetric growth will be non-planar, growth will uh, be quite complicated. And uh, at the end, the distribution of the stress intensity factors will be quite constant along the crack front. Another situation in which from the initial crack, you see you have this large, wings towards the ends. Now, getting into the measurements, uh, this was a model in which we had uh, two initial cracks uh, with different initial lengths. One of the cracks grew, one uh, the other remained essentially on the same position. So this is what uh, happens in uh, many cases. So you have, uh, uh, well, the case uh, which we have also noticed for interface cracks, when uh, you suppose that you have some uh, symmetry, but symmetry is not perfect, and then, of course, one of these cracks will uh, uh, take over the propagation, the other will uh, remain. And here you have a um, fringe uh, pattern for uh, first order multiplication and third order multiplication in such a slice. Uh, which is growing. This is, uh, once again, around one millimeter. You can cut the slice normal to the crack front, which uh, thickness may be around one millimeter, but it's not always the same, of course. 
And this shows clearly the presence of mode two here because you see this part of the uh, fringes on this upper side, let's say, lean forward and this lean backward. So you need in this situation to apply a mixed mode algorithm. And of course, starting from the fringe order multiplication, you start the compensation, make precise measurements in order to establish what is going on. Going to give you some examples. Here you have uh, all data which were established for uh, third order multiplication. And of course, you cannot go close to the crack tip. So here in this situation, below r over square root of r over a 0 0.1. And uh, here we had uh, these um, dimensions of the cracks of the physical dimension, the ratio between uh, uh, crack depth and crack length of the surface, the inner surface of the tip and crack length and thickness of the um, photoelastic model. So of course, out of so many data and well, uh, if you get so many data, you can be happy. Of course, you can choose what would be useful for extrapolation. So being in the K-dominance region, region, extrapolate this towards the tip of the crack and establish K1. So this this, in fact, uh, uh, F1 values, it is notated here, which has been established, is the ratio, the kind of a normalized stress intensity factor using this relation we were talking about. Here are the middle slices, so the slices, uh, the maximum uh, depth of the propagated crack, different models. Looking now at uh, uh, different measurements and different models, uh, what we can see is essentially, if you look at least at this, uh, and you have different uh, positions of the crack, off-axis straight in or off-axis inclined. Um, and at the end, we were looking uh, about for the F1 values of this means uh, mode one in the middle slice. We had also slices that uh, some other uh, positions close to the surface at uh, 20 degrees. So if you have uh, a small propagation of the crack, uh, in the middle slice, you have a higher value of uh, uh, this normalized uh, stress intensity factor. If crack grows more, so this means eight, close to 19 millimeters uh, compared to three millimeters, this value decreases as stress intensity factor is, uh, let's say, readjusting itself towards all the surface of the crack. We tried also uh, to make some comparison with uh, numerical simulation done on Frank uh, 2 d propagation. And uh, from the point of view of propagation by itself, of course, this is a mode one, uh, crack one, how it is called, uh, mode one propagation. We had uh, uh, quite a good, uh, well, uh, comparison, at least from the point of view of uh, crack shape after propagation, yes, from the initial crack towards the final crack. Uh, or later uh, on, if uh, moving towards this uh, off-axis straight crack, again, things don't look too bad. Uh, still having some mode one uh, after propagation, but uh, this, of course, is very small compared to mode two. For uh, 3D measurements uh, and uh, for 3D, sorry, uh, numerical simulation, we used Frank 3D some years ago. And I would like to point out uh, this uh, comparison of results because uh, this is quite interesting. Um, this is a 2D Frank, uh, Frank 2D solution, yes, of uh, normalized sieves with respect to, here it's A over T, so this uh, is uh, simply the ratio between crack length and uh, uh, thickness of the model. Experimental data are shown here with uh, uh, square and triangle. This is middle slice, square, and black triangle is uh, 20 degrees from the surface. And here are the, the numerical values, again, for the same positions, middle and uh, close to the surface. So uh, 
we were able at that moment to have numerical values only for this uh, ratios. Experimental results show that uh, what is at the surface from the point of view of normalized stress intensity factor is a little bit greater than in the middle and uh, it slightly decreases as I have mentioned previously. Uh, if uh, crack is grown more, we had this extreme experimental situation when we had this ratio 0 0.7, so the crack almost penetrated and we had also situations for uh, penetrative crack. Well, does photoelasticity have a future? Yes, it does. I have looked a little bit to see the recent papers, engineering fracture mechanics and optics and lasers in engineering. So people are using uh, frozen stress technique uh, for uh, 3D printing uh, materials here. It's, um, well, they of course change a little bit to more kind of automated photoelasticity. Uh, fringe order multiplication uh, it can be done numerically. So. Uh, systems are improved from the point of view of, uh, I mean, uh, compared to the traditional uh, method. Here you have a whole field stress uh, fracture for some uh, biomedical application, but uh, we have uh, to be confident that such an experimental method is still uh, useful and can be, uh, of course, improved further on. Just a few things about optical methods in fracture mechanics. Uh, there are a bunch of methods. Moiré methods uh, have uh, different types, uh, electron moiré. Uh, uh, it is also uh, laser moiré, moiré interferometry, moiré interferometry. Uh, father of moiré interferometry is Professor Daniel Post. This is probably the best book to look in if you're interested into Moiré. Moiré is a uh, well, complicated method from the point of view of sensitivity. Uh, these were PhD students of Professor Post. Uh, so you have a sensitivity in Moiré with uh, 0 0.25 micrometer per fringe. Uh, electronic speckle pattern interferometry is also a very sensitive method, uh, maybe too sensitive and has to be used in the lab. But on the other hand, digital image correlation, which is um, um, nowadays uh, quite used, uh, which is a, well, kind of optical method, uh, let me put it like this, uh, has a strain resolution typically of 0 0.01. Um, advantage is it can be used uh, anywhere. Uh, and uh, more than that, now uh, people have moved to the so-called micro DIC. So you have a uh, better resolution uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, digital image correlation. So we looked for behavior of uh, damage of composites for many types of materials, uh, all kinds of sandwiches, all kinds of uh, foams, all kinds of, uh, let's say, laminated uh, composites. And uh, one of the first uh, more uh, interesting test from the point of view of our discussion is uh, mode one testing of uh, the laminations and their propagation in the sandwich composites. So uh, this uh, were the specimens we have tested. We used the Arami system. Uh, we had this uh, system, uh, we have used this extensively since 2008. So we have already some experience and uh, we were looking, of course, on what was going on with this crack going uh, along the interfacing between the skin and the core. Core was a foam. And uh, as I mentioned before, even if you uh, consider two initial artificial crack of same length, one of them will take further and will grow. The other one will stay at its uh, initial uh, position. So we were interested in uh, local uh, strains at the crack tip and uh, we have done all kinds of uh, measurements of the opening and propagation of the crack at the interface. Um, and uh, of course we were interested to look for the strain fields. If you have uh, precise measurements, you can establish what is happening 
when the crack uh, starts to propagate, and here you have two curves, one showing the variation of the strains at uh, in the foam and the one, uh, let's say, uh, in the interface, along the interface. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, this type of uh, DIC analysis is uh, very useful uh, for in looking for uh, damage initiation and even propagation. What we did, we uh, emulated, let's say, virtual uh, strain gauges, which uh, were in different positions uh, across the um, delamination in between the, uh, let's say, core and the skin. Uh, so uh, measuring, of course, uh, the strain variation uh, all, along all these uh, uh, virtual strain gauges as crack was propagating then here you have the variation of the strains in successful uh, su successful variation uh, successive variation sorry in different points measured along the interface another issue we were interested in was behavior and damage of nanocomposites um, this was um, uh, done with some uh, special equipment. Uh, you need a shear mixer, you need a sonicator, you need a programmable oven. Uh, we have used multi wall carbon nanotubes to mix into different epoxy resins or different nanopowders of uh, um, well, different kind and size. So essentially, we were kind of transferring some technology from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and we were pouring uh, uh, in the silicon molds uh, these tensile specimens. Um, of course, mixing or not mixing before different uh, uh, fillers, nano fillers, and carbon nanotubes, and so on. So, as nano powders, we had a bunch of. Uh, Nanopowders we stopped mainly for analyzing, analyzing uh, aluminium oxide and uh, silicon dioxide. Uh, this gave a more interesting results. Um, we used uh, single edge notch tension specimens. And this is what is going on uh, before failure. Uh, here the, the crack was obstructed because it gave uh, the spurious uh, results measure values. However, uh, the problem of mixing uh, nanopowders and uh, carbon nanotubes in uh, uh, all kinds of nanofillers into the epoxy is not simple because, uh, well, uh, presumably you are going to get some improvement of properties and you get a certain improvement of properties uh, from a point of view of strength, from the point of view of stiffness, but uh, elongation as failure, uh, so toughness by itself uh, is not convincing from point of view of value. So why does this happen? We're going to see immediately. From the point of view of uh, mode one stress intensity factor, we got some values which were peculiar. Uh, now, I have to mention here that the crack is done uh, by striking with a blade and um, in some cases uh, as having fragile materials, uh, epoxy is essentially fragile, uh, the specimen broke. Um, normally speaking, epoxy has a toughness of below one megapascal square root of meter. Uh, and uh, this is how it should be. So you want to increase toughness. But uh, we feel that uh, this increase of toughness uh, is not uh, correct as you see, we got for pure epoxy 3.08 and this cannot be correct. So these results uh, are under question. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we are still planning to come back to this. Uh, I'm going to explain it how. So how looks the failure surface of such specimens, uh, epoxy specimens? Uh, well, this is pure epoxy. This is uh, failure sur surface for single edge nose specimen with carbon nanotubes. 
This is the initial crack after hitting with a blade. And here what you see are uh, the carbon nanotubes dispersed somehow. Well, how they are dispersed in some cases quite poorly. And this is unfortunately a big problem because, um, let's say, talking about nanotubes, uh, they can conglomerate like this, uh, and this is uh, bad news. Of course, you can have, uh, this is a nanotube here, where, which came out, and the other one, you have somewhere in between 30 and 45 nanometer diameter. But conglomeration is not good because conglomeration, as it is here for some alumina nanoparticle, 0.3%, um, will be a stress raiser, local stress raiser, at, uh, and the crack will initiate from here. From the point of view of um, uh, multi wall uh, nanotubes, again, uh, conglomeration is possible, and on the other hand, uh, we have seen from our experience that it is uh, mostly impossible to mix if you uh, these nanotubes into the resin if you have a weight percentage greater than one. On the other hand, you may have cavities on the surface, air bubbles, if you don't get rid of them. And here, of course, uh, well, it's 0.5% uh, alumina, again, dispersion, which is uh, not really uh, well, well done. This is not only our problem. I have noticed that conglomeration of nanoparticles and nanotubes is an issue. Shortly about uh, shear behavior of sandwich uh, geometries. Uh, well, here um, we were looking for uh, this type of uh, <laughs> shear properties of adhesive joints. So. Um, here you have a polyurethane foam, adhesive, and the adherents are, here, here is the inner one, and here are the outer ones. So you have all kinds of uh, uh, indications in standards. Uh, you have all kinds of possible geometries. We were mainly doing our tests using this uh, type of uh, loading and um, arrangement uh, following this ASTM standard. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, we uh, had adherents made from aluminum, uh, foam, uh, necuron density 325, and Hansmann adhesive in between uh, the adherents and the foam. So, uh, here are the dimensions. Uh, what may happen from the point of view of failure initiation, and this was what we were looking for uh, using the IC. Uh, well, um, essentially failure in most of the situations initiates uh, from uh, in the foam uh, closer to the inner adherence. So this would be the crack which will initiate and propagate. Uh, you may also have some bending of the adherent. Uh, if the adherent is uh, thinner, let's say if it's like four millimeters, it may bend or even less. And uh, uh, in few cases, we had uh, symmetry uh, at, in failure in, at the inner adherence uh, in between uh, foam and the uh, inner adherence. So uh, in most of the situations we had a cohesive failure in the foam close to the adhesive layer. You, we used the caliber of 35 times 28 millimeters, uh, a facet of 27 by 15 uh, pixels to have more uh, precision in measurement. Uh, we sent it with a PhD physics uh, some time ago. And uh, uh, we looked for different thicknesses of the foam and uh, two, I think, overlap uh, lengths 25 and 50, measuring uh, the major strain and the shear angle and looking, of course, what for the initiation and behavior of uh, damage propagation, let's say. Yeah. So you have some, uh, sorry, for the Mises strain, of course, this is the point where the crack will initiate. You have, as you see here, some, uh, let's say, tips in the Mises strain uh, at the point of initiation and variation of the shear angle. So 
Essentially, using this method, you can have quite uh, precise measurements. Here is the other case of uh, 50 millimeter overlap. In this case, you had some damage starting from here, this interface on the right side. Yeah, as you can see. Uh, pinning strain, this is along the horizontal axis, uh, which is critical usually in this location. Again, close to the inner and there, and as you can see, so you have, you can obtain nice reports and having the variation evolution of the strains in different moments, and uh, of course it helps a lot. Uh, well, another issue was on uh, uh, foams. Uh, we did uh, different types of tests uh, and uh, we had also a contract uh, with uh, Professor Marshall Vina in which we worked and uh, we uh, obtained quite interesting things. For uh, using DIC for damage assessment, this is I wanted to stop uh, a little bit uh, on, on my comments. On this issue, um, things are very interesting, uh, interesting from the point of view of uh, deformation bands. Uh, this is an issue which for me is not yet very clear because uh, there are uh, different variables, let's put it like this. So first of all, you are able to create uh, in uh, using the IC such a very nice, let's say, report in the sense that, as you can see here, you can have uh, the conventional characteristic curve and different moments. Uh, you can look for the Mises strain separately. At this moment, let's say you have this maximum value in this location, let's say 2.2%. You can look on the vertical displacement, so vertical displacement along the middle vertical axis from uh, uh, minus uh, 1.1 millimeters on the top to minus 0 0.3, let's say, on the bottom. And then, of course, this is, uh, these are different stages. As uh, loading is applied, this is compressive, compressive loading. Of course, you are moving in different locations and you have, uh, of course, uh, you are able to follow this uh, variation of the strains again along the middle line of the Passiman loaded in compression. So this is 100 kilograms per cubic meter density, the lowest we have tested. And of course, you can see that uh, in different stages already you have uh, damage of the foam on the surface and you cannot really have, uh, I mean, these points are already taken out from the measurements, but Essentially, towards the end of the test, you are going to have, uh, let's say, uh, as you can see here, a middle deformation band and uh, a local strain, which is uh, practically equal to the global one, let's put it like this. So the important thing I, was, I want to underline is that you can have very precise measurements of local strains following what is going on uh, at different stages. And here you have, uh, um, at the end, uh, for the same 100 density, uh, kilogram per meter cube density, you have, you see this kind of uh, localization of the deformation bands. Uh, these are two different moments, uh, not very far one from the other, but the interesting thing is that the Mises strain in this position are having, are looking like this. So you have kind of two different uh, uh, the formation bands, which later on concentrate towards one of them and moving a little bit towards the uh, lower part of the specimen. And again, uh, another situation uh, in which we move a little bit further away. This is another density and you have uh, this kind of uh, the, uh, damage and deformation uh, of the um, polyurethane foam. This is a polyurethane. We published uh, some of these results and uh, here of course uh, as I mentioned uh, things uh, are not so simple because uh, uh, if you change the density you may have some other distribution 
of the deformation bands, as you can see here, so line kind of X distribution. I would like to show you uh, what is going on. So this is a short movie taken. So the point moves. So you are on the characteristic curve. Yes, at different points. So what you see is, of course, this kind of localization of the strain. At a certain moment, one of these curves is becoming red as you reach the point, as you see here, it was the first one. And then looking, this is of course uh, more easy to follow, but looking on the Mises strain, you have this uh, kind of uh, uh, deformation band getting more localized in uh, this particular case. This is 100 kilogram per cubic meter in uh, this uh, location. Uh, sorry, I have to stop this and I, okay, let me take this from the beginning. Okay, this would be 140, sorry. So, uh, change density, yes, and you can see already the deformation band here is coming uh, on this direction, yeah, in more like 45, like shearing. And then, of course, what is going on is that uh, as loading is applied, this deformation band is uh, uh, going horizontal. So, and uh, you have uh, 50, 60% compared uh, to, let's say, less than 2015 local value of the strain is uh, much higher. And of course, this uh, uh, shows once again uh, that uh, the damage and uh, this type of deformation bands are moving uh, quite interestingly. Okay, and now 325, one more example, in which <coughs> you have this uh, X type of deformation bands, yeah, as I was mentioning before. And then this strain is localized as this uh, intersection, yeah, and it's moving little by little. Towards the middle part of the specimen. Okay, so now at the end, some things about current research in additive manufacturing and what we are doing in um, our department. We started this year um, MRANET project uh, uh, from 20 to 23. It is uh, dedicated to reactive inkjet printing of epoxy thermoset composites. Um, there are partners from Austria and from Romania. All three Austrian partners are chemists, by the way. We are mechanical engineers, so we are doing the mechanical testing and uh, we are going to perform also on numerical uh, uh, stochastic simulations. Uh, coordination is your own research. Uh, we are a um, good research institute. And uh, what are we trying to do? Uh, we are going to pioneer heterogeneous epoxy, so we are looking for epoxy polyamine resins. This partner is in fact the producer of this uh, type of different resins. Um, we are looking to mix together uh, hard and soft uh, microscale subdomains. This would be quite a challenge. Why? Because we want to play with the material toughness in different locations, uh, depending on the loading. And of course, we don't want to compromise strength and stiffness. And uh, we also think about using functionalized nanoparticles. The problem of functionalization of nanoparticles is critical. Yeah? 
I forgot to mention previously for the, all these nanocomposites that if you don't have proper functionalized uh, nanoparticles, which chemists can do, you are lost in the problem of Done. We cannot hear you anymore. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. I think something goes wrong with, with uh, Professor Constantinescu network, probably. Mr. Professor, try to call him. To call him by phone? Yes. S-a conectat. Profesor Constantinescu? Uh, the mic is uh, closed. You are on mute. I'm sorry, I was disconnected. Sorry for this. Uh, I had to change my uh, uh, Wi-Fi connection and uh, I'm going to come back to uh, the presentation. Uh, I realized that something is wrong. So uh, is this okay now? Is it okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I was mentioning and I uh, stopped. But we cannot see your presentation. Ah, you cannot. Okay. So let me share it once again. I will in a minute. Okay. So here you are. And. Yes. Now. So you see it. Okay. You see it now? I hope yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Sorry for it's okay. I had to. I had to. Uh, again to change uh, Wi-Fi uh, connection. So uh, what uh, would be the, let's say, uh, needs, practically speaking? Yeah, practically speaking, people are doing a lot of uh, uh, printing with thermoplastics, but not too much with uh, thermosets. So we are looking for uh, different types of epoxy uh, resins on one hand. On the other hand, we know that epoxy is brittle. Therefore, uh, we have to improve the toughness. And this is the main uh, idea of this hard and soft micro domains. So essentially looking uh, for different 
combinations in during the printing with this in uh, reactive uh, in, in, in this moment concerning additive manufacturing uh, well we have five we have a, it uses digital light process uh, photopolymerized photopolymerized at once here we have printed and we have started to test uh, different type of uh, mechanical metamaterials uh, here you have only some examples on tested uh, zero it schwarz p and schwarz d diamond uh, uh, topologies. Um, uh, well, uh, unfortunately, you cannot use digital image correlation on this. Why you cannot use? Because uh, surfaces are very complicated and uh, practically it is uh, essentially impossible to have a calibration and to be able to uh, get some results. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, we are uh, using, and uh, by the way, we plan also to do some type of lattice, simple cubic lattice uh, uh, printing. Uh, hopefully it will be much easier. On the other hand, for uh, FDM, we are using this type of uh, Creality and the 5 Pro printer. Uh, well, here we are following an older idea of different uh, cores and different types of sandwich structures. Uh, here, uh, what you can see, first of all, you have some uh, variable, let's say, uh, density over the thickness uh, arrangement. So, uh, these are uh, cells which are smaller in size. And uh, doing compression tests, uh, this crash first, regardless of their position, top, bottom, or quite in the middle. Of course, there is some buckling also here. Or uh, we are trying uh, to compare uh, different types of cells. This would be, of course, honeycombs. And these are uh, two thicknesses here of the wall thickness, 0 0.15, 0 0.25, uh, kind of reentrant. Uh, <coughs> reentrant uh, auxetic topology mm. uh, and uh, this uh, of course uh, uh, is another possibility or the chiral topology auxetic as you can see here so uh, this uh, 0 0.15 is also 0 0.15 it proves this was already tested but the recovery was excellent it went back practically to the initial position. If you increase the thickness of the wall, you get, of course, uh, in the three-point bending, this is three-point bending, by the way, I think I forgot to mention. In three-point bending, you have some local crushing here and so on. So all this type of uh, uh, tests uh, on this uh, additive manufactured materials are going to continue. We are uh, looking here to improve the energy absorption of uh, these materials in impact. So we have an instron uh, uh, crush tower, drop tower <coughs> to be used. We did this on uh, um, sandwiches with uh, foams and now we are moving towards these printed materials. Experimental methods are really beautiful, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Professor Constantinescu, for your interesting presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, so.